Hello, and welcome to another installment of AMWA After Hours. This evening, we will be exploring the queer history of the West that is so often left out of our narrative of who headed West and why. The queer history of the West might be a relatively recent topic for academics, but queer people have always been here. As long as there have been humans, there have been queer humans. If you have any questions during the presentation, please put them into the chat box and we will answer them at the end during the Q&A. When asked to describe or explain the type of individuals that headed west during the colonization of the United States, more often than not, we think of rough, rugged individuals, namely heterosexual men who headed west to expand and quote unquote, tame the frontier. The expansion of the West, however, attracted all types of people, from rugged heterosexual men, to families looking to start a new life, to queer people seeking solace in a place where no one knew them. The myth of the West being a utopian space full of possibility and wonder, ready and ripe for the taking, is a myth that captured the minds of Europeans as they began to explore North America. Francisco Vasquez de Coronado was the first European to explore the Great Plains in 1541. Coronado had embarked on his expedition in search of gold, jewels, great cities, and the utopian myth of the Western Plains, plus the driving force of Christianity and its morals. These Christian morals played a role in the propaganda that was used to indoctrinate the indigenous that already lived and thrived in North America before the arrival of European colonizers. Indigenous peoples living in the Great Plains area of North America, long before the arrival of European colonizers, held fluid beliefs and practices around gender and sexuality. One of those beliefs and practices is the two-spirit person. The two-spirit person plays a specific honored role within Indigenous nations. Two-Spirit is an English term that first came about in 1990 at a gathering of Native queer and Two-Spirit people, meant to replace the derogatory term that had been used by colonial settlers to describe Two-Spirit people. Upon colonizing the plains, there were several documented accounts that describe men of different Indigenous nations taking on feminine roles and dress, what could best be described in English colonizer definitions as transgender. Two-spirit can also be described in English colonizer definitions as non-binary. To best explain what two-spirit means, I think Indigenous professor of gender and sexuality studies, Quo Lee Driscoll, puts it in an easier way to be understood by English, Euro-American minds and language. Driscoll writes, quote, the term two-spirit is a word that resists colonial definitions of who we are. It is an expression of our sexual and gender identities as so varied from those of white GLBT movements. The coinage of the word was never meant to create a monolithic understanding of the array of native traditions regarding what dominant European and Euro-American traditions call alternative genders and sexualities, end quote. He continues, quote, the process of translating two-spiritness with terms in white communities becomes very complex. I'm not necessarily queer in Cherokee contexts because differences are not seen in the same light as they are in Euro-American contexts. I'm not necessarily transgender in Cherokee contexts because I'm simply the gender I am." End quote. Before we move forward in our discussion of the queer West, I think it's worth discussing the notion of gender within itself. American theorist Judith Warber argues that gender is a construct that inherently created a system of stratification and social structure that was and still is dominant in Eurocentric and American cultures. I argue, argue Eurocentric American cultures because not all cultures believed in this construct. For example, in the quote I just read from Driscoll, he wrote, quote, I'm not necessarily transgender in Cherokee contexts because I'm simply the gender I am, end quote. Biological sex does not equate gender. Rather, gender is a learned construct. Gender and gender roles and ideals had different narratives outside of the traditional construct context that we as Americans know them in. Since this presentation is focused on the history of the queer West, I won't deep dive into the notion of gender as a construct. But if you'd like to further your understanding of this, I recommend the writings of Judith Butler and Judith Warber to start. <laughs> 
Some scholars have argued that the fluid beliefs and practices around gender and sexuality by indigenous nations was one of the reasons that was used in justification for the Spanish conquest of the new world. Some 200 years after Coronado's arrival in the Great Plains, there began to be recorded accounts of Spanish Franciscans in California attempting to weed out and punish those who did not conform to the Christian ideals of heterosexuality and heteronormative gender. Indigenous men who did not align with heterosexuality or masculine traits were punished. The Spanish Franciscans considered them to be quote unquote accursed people and had hopes that they would soon quote disappear with the growth of the missions, end quote. As westward expansion took hold and more people began to head west in the 19th century, more written accounts of queer and transgender and non-binary non identity began to appear. Journalist and Congressman Horace Greeley, whom Greeley, Colorado is named after, wrote of an encounter he had in Eastern Colorado on May 29, 1859. Greeley had embarked on a five month trip along the newly minted Pikes Peak Express from coast to coast and kept a detailed journal of the journey titled An Overland Journey from New York to San Francisco in the summer of 1859. An entry from May 29, 1859 documents Greeley's encounter with a young clerk at Station 11 in Clear Creek, Colorado, who relays news of the Colorado Gold Rush. Greeley writes, quote, a young clerk with whom I conversed at supper gave me a little discouraging, discouraging account, but even he, having frozen his feet on, this, on the winter journey out, had had enough of gold hunting and was going home to his parents in Indiana in Indiana to stick to school for a few years. I commended that as a wise resolution. Next morning, after we had started on our opposite ways, I was apprised by our conductor that said clerk was a woman. I had not dreamed of such a thing, but his more practical or more suspicious eyes had seen through her disguise at once. We hear more of her at Denver, quite enough more, but this may as well be left untold, end quote. Greeley's encounter with this person was not an un uncommon happening in the West. Women donning the clothing of men to head West for a variety of reasons, from seeking gold and fortune to adventure, to being free from the stipulations society placed on women at the time. For some, it was easier to travel through the West dressed in masculine clothing. For others, they might not have been a woman at all, but instead saw the West as an opportunity to live out their life as they had always felt internally as a man. Another American journalist, Albert D. Richardson, documented a similar experience to Greeley's when describing an advertisement seen in the San Diego Herald seeking a young man to join a gold mining journey. The advertisement was written about by Albert D. Richardson as, quote, the caution which he added, no young woman in disguise need apply, was needful in mining country. I encountered in the digging several women dressed in masculine apparel, and each telling some romantic story of her past life. One averred that she had twice crossed the plains to California with droves of cattle. Some were adventurers. All were of the wretched class against which society shuts its iron doors, bidding them ha hasten uncared for to destruction. End quote. It's clear from both Greeley and Richardson's accounts that women who adapted to a more masculine personality or way of presenting themselves were not exactly welcomed by everyone. But the West was an easier place to live out their desired realities than if they had remained in the East. It wasn't just women taking on the appearance of men, but men too would choose to live out their lives as a woman. And this was most notably documented by author and public speaker, Elizabeth B. Custer. In Custer's 1885 autobiography, Boots and Saddles, or Life in Dakota with General Custer, she describes a laundress of Mexican descent named Old Nash. Custer had first met Old Nash in Kentucky when she was married to a trooper and worked as a laundress for the Custer family. Custer goes on to boast about how well Old Nash took care of the linen and how impressed Custer was by her. She mentions how Old Nash was fairly shy, only delivering the linen at night and wore a veil that covered the lower part of her face. Custer had written that Old Nash had much more facial hair than other women, writing, quote, she had so coarse and stubborn a beard that her chin had a blue look after shaving, end quote. Old Nash had lived many lives before meeting Custer in Kentucky, 
At one point, she had dressed as a man to support herself and took on a job of driving ox teams over the plains in New Mexico, but eventually the railroad made this job obsolete, forcing Old Nash to seek employment elsewhere. Resuming her life as a woman, she entered the army, accumulating money through baking pies, doing laundry, and sewing clothes for the soldiers. While working in Kentucky, Custer received word that Old Nash was not doing well, and upon checking up on her, Custer found that Old Nash's husband had stolen her money and left her. Unfortunately, this wouldn't be the only man to steal her money and desert her. She married another soldier who followed suit of her first husband, stealing her money and leaving her desolate. Never one to mourn her husband's long, Old Nash was eventually married a third time to the handsomest soldier in his company, whom she would affectionately refer to as her Manny Manny. Later, Custer had approached Old Nash to hire her as a midwife for her pregnant friend. Old Nash had obliged so long as she could return home each evening to cook dinner for her Manny Manny. Old Nash was gentle in the way she cared for Custer's friend and every so often would ask, are you comf? Meaning comfortable. After Old Nash finished her midwife duties, she returned to work as a laundress, but began to slow down with rheumatism, and a few years later passed on. She had asked the woman in the camp to put her in her coffin just as she was when she died, asking them not to change her clothing. Unfortunately, after her death, the woman felt her final wish didn't pay Old Nash the proper respect she deserved, and they broke the promise. Revealing a secret Old Nash had managed to hide from everyone, Old Nash had in fact been born a man. After her biological sex had been revealed and her husband, unable to face the torment and teasing from the rest of the soldiers, killed himself. When Custer's friend, who Old Nash had midwifed for, had learned of her ill fate, she stated, quote, poor old thing, I hope she is comf at last, end quote. It's interesting to note the care Custer took in writing about Old Nash compared to Greeley or Richardson's disgust with learning that there were women who dressed and passed as men in the West. When writing about Old Nash, already knowing that she had been born with the anatomy of the man, Custer continues to refer to her as a woman and doesn't speak ill of Old Nash after it was revealed who she had been. While the idea of homosexuality and queerness was often looked down upon by the general public, there were some instances where it was quietly accepted but not spoken about. Cue the Western fur trade and annual rendezvous. The Rocky Mountain Rendezvous was created in the 1820s by St. Louis politician and businessman, William H. Ashley. Ashley had put up ads for 100 enterprising young men to remain in the mountains for two to three years hunting and trapping. After the men spent the year trapping, a caravan of traders from St. Louis would meet them at a prearranged spot in June or July to trade their pelts for goods and supplies. The rendezvous was so successful that by the 1830s, several fur companies followed in suit and soon the rendezvous attracted both company and free trappers as well as indigenous trappers. The rendezvous lasted several weeks and short story writer Washington Irving referred to it as quote, Saturnalia among the, of the mountains, end quote. Saturnalia was an ancient Roman holiday that honored the god of seed sowing, Saturn. Originally, it was just a one-day celebration that eventually spread to an entire week. The rendezvous grew so quickly that more than just traders and trappers began to arrive at them. Instead, men of all backgrounds interested in the western frontier and all it had to offer would attend the rendezvous as well. One of these men was Sir William Drummond Stewart from Perthshire, Scotland. Stewart was the second son of Sir George Stewart, 17th Lord of Grantley, 5th Baronet of Murthley, and Lady Catherine Drummond Stewart, and had grown up on his family's estate, Murthley Castle. Stewart, from a young age, was more interested in adventure than education, and his father purchased him a cornetcy in the 6th Dragoon Guards. But after Stuart found the guards to be unfriendly, he asked his father to purchase him a lieutenancy in the 15th King's Light Dragoons. The 15th King's Light Dragoons were best known for their fancy dress and appearance rather than their military advantages. However, when Stuart joined them, they were fighting Napoleon during the Peninsula War. Stuart worked his way up to captain before leaving his military endeavors in search of his next adventure. 
He traveled around a bit before fathering an illegitimate son with his servant, Christian Battersby. Stuart had very minimal contact with Battersby after the birth of their son and never fostered any kind of relationship with her, only ensuring annuity payments were made, an indication that there was never an emotional attachment between the two. Author of Men in Eden, William Drummond Stewart, Drummer Stewart and the same-sex desire in the Rocky Mountain fur trade, William Benjamin writes, quote, whatever the dynamics of William and Christie's sexual liaison, whatever his reasons for entering into the relationship, their union was brief and unique. Never again would his name be linked with that of a woman, end quote. When Stewart's father passed in 1827, Stewart's inheritance was awarded in the form of a $150 annuity. Stewart attempted to sue his brother, John, who had received the estate and the largest inheritance for the full lump sum of Stewart's inheritance to be paid immediately. Stewart was unsuccessful in obtaining the lump sum, but was successful in driving a divide between the two brothers. After settling on his inheritance, Stewart decided to head to America in 1832. Upon his arrival in New York, he met J. Watson Webb, politician, adventurer, and editor of the New York Courier and Enquirer who gave him letters of introduction to use when meeting some of Campbell, some of Webb's friends in St. Louis. Stuart traveled to St. Louis and met William Sublett and Robert Campbell through Webb's introduction. Sublett and Campbell were fur trappers who had just returned from the 1832 rendezvous and their tales of the frontier excited Stuart, who offered them $500 to join their caravan for the next rendezvous. Stuart attended the 1833 rendezvous held in what's today known as Western Wyoming. The rendezvous was unlike anything Stuart had seen before. Free and company trappers, indigenous peoples, and traders all frolicking among games of chance, powwows, horse races, and rough and tumble fights. It was this rendezvous that Stuart would meet Antoine Clement, the son of a French Canadian father and a Cree woman, whom Stuart would share an intimate and emotional relationship with. In Stuart's autobiographical novel, Edward Warren, he writes of his first acquaintance with Clement. Quote, the figure which stood before us was that of a youth under 20, with light brown hair worn long and the almond-shaped hazel eyes of his mother's brace. His dress was almost Indian, consisting of a leather shirt and leggings, coming a little above the knee, almost to meet it, and tied up to the waist belt by a small trip, strip of leather on the outside of each thigh." End quote. Clement was an expert hunter who enjoyed the social atmosphere of the rendezvous. As the rendezvous came to a close and hunting and trapper and trader parties went their separate ways, Stuart decided to follow Clement rather than head back east with Sublet and Campbell. Clement had been hired by Thomas Fitzpatrick to be his chief hunter for a trip along the Little Horn Powder and Tongue Rivers. Eventually, their travel paths would diverge, but for the next several years, Stuart would attend the annual rendezvous, meeting Clement there again at the 1835 rendezvous. Stuart became well known at the rendezvous. He held open air dinner parties that consisted of fine wines and brandies and canned sardines a nice reprise from the buffalo and antelope that was in Bounty at the rendezvous. He was known for his hunting and writing abilities and the unending, exhilarating stories he told. At the 1835 rendezvous, Stuart and Clement picked back up their relationship and traveled east together to stay with Clement's family. In 1836, Stuart learned his brother John was ill and Stuart knew he would have to return to Merdley Castle soon. With this in mind, he considered the 1837 rendezvous a farewell and hired artist Alfred Jacob Miller to accompany and document he, Clement, and the rest of the group's journey to the rendezvous. When it was time for Stuart to return to Merthley Castle to take over the family inheritance, he, wrote, he brought Clement with him with the explanation that Clement was his valet. While Stuart worked and entertained at the castle, he and Clement lived together in nearby Dalpoe Lodge a retreat part of the Merthley estate. The two traveled around Europe together and Stuart often purchased Clement gifts and clothing to be shown off in. Miller was commissioned by Stuart to complete several paintings from Merthley Castle and stayed at the castle while completing the commissions. Miller wrote of Clement, quote, 
I am told that while in the mountains, he was twice instrumental in saving his master's life. And for this reason, I have no doubt he indulges him. He presented him the other day with a full Highland suit, which cost 50 pounds, end quote. In many of the paintings Miller completed during their journey to the 1837 rendezvous and the various commissions from Stuart later, Clement is always positioned closely to Stuart. In 1842, Stuart and Clement returned to America for one final celebration in the mountains. Stuart even brought with him various items of clothing for his proposed Renaissance costume party. By 1840, the rendezvous was no longer held due to changing fashions and the diminishment of beaver pelts. So Stuart took it upon himself to throw his own version of the rendezvous for his own personal enjoyment. An old acquaintance of Stuart's, Friedrich Armand Strubberg, happened upon Stuart's costume party in the Rocky Mountains while on a hunting expedition. Strubberg was shocked to happen upon the scene before him. He wrote, quote, before their amazed eyes spread what appeared to be a rollicking medieval market fair magically transported to the American West. Festive pennants waved above a jumble of colorful tents. Here and there, naked men crawled out from beneath striped canvas and ran to a nearby lake where they hooted and splashed in the morning sunlight. The revelers, around 80 of them in total, were mostly young men in their teens and 20s and those who were clothed could be seen sporting the most fantastic and colorful costumes." End quote. Stuart would return to Murthley Castle after this final party alone, but left a stipend to be paid to Clement to help continue to support him for his remaining years. Similar to the hunters and trappers of the Rocky Mountains, the life of a cowboy on the plains was one that relied heavily on other men. Cowboys often worked with one or multiple partners as they herded cattle across the plains. Literature professor Chris Packard writes of the cowboy partnership, quote, Cowboy partnerships occur exclusively outside of communities, but their bonds include shared emotional intimacy, mutual affection, spiritual correspondences, and physical closeness, end quote. The affection that was shared between cowboys is usually depicted as a deep bond built off of their need to rely on one another to survive the wilderness. Many cowboys fulfilled their emotional needs with their partners in order to avoid affection with women. Falling in with a woman could lead to the untimely demise of the cowboy's career, leading to children and family responsibilities. These bonds, however, were sometimes more than just friendly. The open range allowed individuals to seek out love and affection as they wanted it rather than what society imposed on them. Badger Clark, known as a cowboy poet, originally from South Dakota, was not exactly a cowboy himself, but became acquainted with many while working on a ranch in Arizona. While at the ranch, he would enthusiastically soak up the stories the cowboys told, assist them on cattle roundups, and even began to use their lingo. Clark would then use their stories and lingo as inspiration for the poems he wrote that meant to encapsulate the life of a cowboy. One poem in particular titled The Lost Partner describes the loss of love between cowboys. Clark's poem is written as follows, quote, I ride alone and hate the boys I meet. Today, some way, their laughing hurts me so. I hate the mocking birds and the mesquite and yet I liked him just a week ago. I hate the steady sun that glares and glares. The bird songs make me sore. I seem the only thing on earth that cares cause Al ain't here no more. Twas just a stumbling haws, a tangled spur. And when I raised him up so limp and weak, one look before his eyes begun to blur and then the blood that wouldn't let him speak and him so strong and yet so quick he died. And after year on year, when he, we had always trailed it side by side, he went and left me here. We loved each other in the way men do and never spoke about it, Al and me. But we both knowed and knowing it so true was more than any woman's kiss could be. We knowed. And if the way was smooth or rough, the weather shine or poor, while I had him, the rest seemed good enough, but he ain't here no more. What is there out beyond the last divide? Seems like that country must be cold and dim. He'd miss this sunny range he used to ride, and he'd miss me, the same as I do him, 
It's no use thinking all I'd think or say could never make it clear. Out that dim trail that only leads one way, he's gone and left me here. The range is empty and the trails are blind and I don't seem but half myself today. I wait to hear him riding up behind and feel his knee rub mine the good old way. He's dead and what that means no man can tell. Some call it gone before. Where? I don't know, but God, I know so well that he ain't here no more." End quote. Clark's poem describes a lost love between two cowboys that was likely a deep queer bond. Quote, we loved each other the way men do and never spoke about it, Al and me, but we both knowed and knowing it so true, end quote. Here Clark italicizes the word knowed, hinting that the love shared between them was evident without needing to be discussed. And the line, quote, was more than any woman's kiss could be, end quote, implies that this relationship was more authentic than he could have had with a woman. In the last stanza of the poem, Clark writes, Quote, I wait to hear him riding up behind and feel his knee rub mine the good old way, end quote. A possible suggestion, suggestion that more than just their knees were rubbing. As the West continued to expand and became more settled, people who lived outside the expected gender and heterosexual norms also continued to seek solace in the West, including this artist in Amwa's collection, Katie Wells. Katie Wells was originally from Massachusetts and from a wealthy family who were amongst some of the first settlers in the New England area. His grandfather had founded the American Optical Company. From early on, Wells was the rebel of the family, doing as he pleased rather than building himself up to compete for control over the family business as the rest of the boys and men in the family did. Wells was noted as having more feminine qualities that concerned his family and had been kicked out of five boarding schools, one time for having been found in bed with another boy. Before his father finally sent him to the Evans Ranch School in Arizona in his father's attempt to toughen him up. Wells's father wrote to him often, encouraging him to spend time outside, exercise to build up his body, and befriend the right kind of boys. His father wrote to him once, quote, we are so anxious for you to be a good, healthy boy and grow up to be a good, healthy man, physically and mentally, end quote. However, it seems as though the boarding school his father had sent him to was a place where many boys were figuring out and experimenting with their sexuality rather than a place to hone their manliness and heterosexuality. It was here that Wells would find his new interest in painting and begin to experiment with it. After graduating from the school, Wells continued to work there for a few years in his early 20s. In February of 1926, Wells headed to Boston to visit family, and his father had him meet with Dr. William Healy, who encouraged him to embrace his masculinity. Dr. Healy was a member of the Behavioristic School of Psychiatry and specialized in juvenile delinquency and criminality. Dr. Healy had performed several quote-unquote mental tests on Wells and concluded that much of what Wells enjoyed he needed to give up in order to be quote-unquote cured. Rather than paint, Wells was to work in manual labor. Wells was to never be alone or socialize with small groups of boys. He was to read only classic writers and not modern literature, and he needed to do specific exercises to help him deepen his voice and toughen the contours of his face. Wells disagreed with all of this and wanted to live his life authentically, but still held on to the fear of displeasing and disappointing his family. This anxious self-doubt would prevail throughout the rest of his career and be evident in his landscapes of New Mexico. After Wells had submitted some paintings to photographer, to photographer Alfred Stieglitz in hopes to be featured in his gallery, Stieglitz wrote to him with disinterest, posing him to dig deeper. In Wells's letter back to Stieglitz, he wrote, quote, I am 28 and have spent most of my life so far trying to justify my existence to my family and not to myself, which wasn't smart, end quote. Even while carrying this anxiety, Wells still decided to pursue the life he felt was best for him and began to study art. He eventually returned to New Mexico in 1932 after traveling abroad in China, Japan, and Bali for a while. New Mexico is where Wells would meet the one great love of his life, the writer Myron Brinig. Although Brinig never openly acknowledged his homosexuality, he wrote often of the subject in his letters and novels, 
Brinig wrote a memoir titled Love from a Stranger that documented Brinig and Wells' relationship. Americanist and historian Lois P. Rudnick wrote of their relationship, quote, Myron was a talented, handsome, hard drinking, contentious and difficult partner who loved letting Katie take care of him and plan his life. Eventually, Katie came to resent his caretaker role and Myron's proclivity for antagonizing their mutual friends. Although they remained friends, Wells mourned the end of their affair, writing in 1946 that this had been the only time in his life he had been able to sustain a love relationship, end quote. The Western Plains, Rocky Mountains, and modern Santa Fe are all locations that allowed members of the queer community to seek solace and acceptance. The colonizing, heteronormative ideals that dominated the minds of the populated East were superimposed on anyone that didn't fit within these constructs. But out West, the queer community had a better chance to maneuver through the world as their true selves and exist without feeling as much of the shame that society placed on them for just wanting to live their lives and love who they wanted to. Thank you for joining us this evening for another rendition of Ewa After Hours, specifically about the queer West. <laughs>